Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our service broadcast live from Thurfield Chapel. Unfortunately, we aren't able to meet as we would normally do together, but uh, it's good to meet nevertheless over Facebook. And hopefully, in the very near future, we will be able to return to normal services. Uh, keep praying. Let's have a look and see who's joined so far this morning. We have uh, Lizzie White, Morning Old, Claire Marsden, Debbie Lindborg, Andrew Proudfoot, Pauline Taverner, Roger Stepney, and Marie Rip Richards. Good morning to all of you. Right, uh, I think then uh, we should start our service this morning by going into the notices or announcements. And we have three things uh, this week. We start with our Monday evening Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, well, please do join us for that at 7.30. It's open to everybody. The link is on the email that we send out. Uh, Tuesday prayer meeting, uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, again, on Zoom. Uh, it's actually a Bible study this week. And um, I'm leading it, and it's on Luke chapter. It's in Luke chapter 12, and the rich fool. And our Thursday night home group uh, is eight o'clock on Zoom, and uh, Ben and Claire are hosting that. Again, all uh, the uh, links to these um, events is on that uh, Zoom. Uh, is on that email we sent out. Right. Who else have we got turned up so far? Phil Reed, good morning to you, Phil. Gareth Thompson, good morning to you. Peter Titterton, and no doubt Phyllis as well. Good morning to both of you. And Lizzie White, it says, morning, hope you're feeling better, Phil. <laughs> and Liz Standen, right, uh, good morning to everybody that's, uh, that's uh, with us so far today. Uh, right, that's uh, all the notices and the comments I've got so far. So I shall now return you to the... Oh, yes, of course, there is uh, one more that I've just been reminded about. After the uh, service uh, uh, today, there will be a little uh, Zoom group for fellowship, as we had last week. Um, is the uh, link to that? It'll be on at the end, so just, uh, just keep... Uh, uh, don't uh, go off, and the link will be there. Right, back to the band for a time of, uh, fellowship, for a time of worship. Good morning. I'm going to read from Psalm 108. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music and melody with all my being. Awake, O harp, I will awake in the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Let's bless him. Bless the Lord, oh my soul.
with us. We thank you that you see and understand our lives, our frustrations and our worries because in the person of the Lord Jesus you came to be with us as one of us, as truly man from truly God. We thank you also that you have promised not to leave us on our own, that you are indeed our good shepherd as we'll be thinking this morning. We just pray that you would forgive us for the times when we doubt this, the times when we are impatient for blessings that are not yet ours, for the times when we focus more on this world and on ourselves rather on the world to come and on others and of course on you. Help us to care for one another as you would care for us. 
be with those who are suffering in lockdown, uh, be with those who have the virus. We thank you for many, including Ashley, who've recovered without uh, many symptoms, and we pray that that would be the case for many more. But we think too for those that are in hospital and pray that you would be with them and give them peace and give peace to their families who are not able to visit them. We think particularly of Suzanne's dad in Wales. And we pray too that you would uh, provide companionship to the lonely. We know that so many struggle in these days when they are not able to go out their homes much and not able to see their loved ones. We pray that they would have some comfort and peace from you. And we pray too that you would help us as your people to minister to one another. We thank you for all that ministry that's already going on, for the helping out that, uh, that we're able to give to one another. And we just pray that in this way that we would minister Christ to one another. Teach us, Lord, what is truly important so that when this pandemic is over, that we might live more as you intend and more by your priorities and not the priorities and intentions which we've had before. Give wisdom to our governments and to our health boards to ensure that uh, any vaccine that's distributed is truly safe and that it is distributed wisely according to need and not according to wealth, uh, not only in our countries but worldwide too. And we pray specifically for an easing of restrictions on churches, Lord. We do long for the time that we can be together again, even if we have to wear masks and even if there are some restrictions on numbers. We pray that our government would lift the restrictions on worship so that we might join together as your people, not only on Christmas Day, uh, but in the run up to Christmas and afterwards as well. That there would be no further uh, restrictions on our ability to gather to worship you because we know that uh, this is our duty and we long to worship you together. Uh, we long that uh, you would be building your church together as we are able to meet and to, to glorify you in our midst. But we thank you that we are able to continue meeting, at least virtually. We thank you for the technology we have. We thank you for those who work so hard to uh, set up the services each week. And we just thank you that we have this opportunity to, to, be with, uh, to be with you, to focus on you now as Joshua comes to speak to us. We pray that you would indeed speak through him. And we pray that although we are under these restrictions and although this is a strange time, that you would still be working in our midst, still be building us up into your body and still be glorified through us. For we ask all this in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple area, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered round him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can ever snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for the blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said that I am God's son. 
Do you not believe me unless I do what my father does? But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but Jesus escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptising in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, Though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true, and in that place many believed in Jesus. All right, hey, good morning boys and girls. It's good to have you who are live on the other end of this camera, as well as those who are here in the chapel. This is primarily the band and uh, those who are clicking and doing that. So. Uh, for those wondering, I don't just speak to an empty room. There are a handful of people up here that help make the service happen. Um, and uh, yeah, fortunately, it's the best looking people in the chapel. It is, it is definitely, yeah, the most attractive people there are here. Isn't that, yeah, Paul? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, <laughs> Dave and Barra, yeah. Um, so we uh, will continue on right through John's gospel. Uh, John gives us a, a lot of scenes a lot of uh, insights from the life of Jesus that Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke did not use in their gospel. So a lot of unique teaching, a lot of unique material goes into this gospel. We're looking now, um, we're in John chapter 10, and we, for those of you who are paying attention, extra points if you notice this, we did not do the first part of John chapter 10. Ben will be doing that next week. So next week I won't be preaching, Ben will be preaching and he'll be doing the first half of the chapter. I'm doing the second half of the chapter. We're just sort of mixing it up. Okay. This begins at the Festival of Dedication. Now, uh, Festival of Dedication probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you. It, but it's a bit, or it happens close to this time of year. The Festival of Dedication is what we would, you know, if you're familiar with Hanukkah today. Uh, many of you would maybe be aware of Hanukkah, even if you don't have any Jewish friends and never celebrated it. That's when, uh, you know, the Jews like this um, Menorah, the, the, the candle with the, um, the seven candlesticks, seven and one, I think is a proper name for it. It was, it's just escaping me at the moment. moment. Uh, but they like the different candles, and, and this holiday comes from the time a couple hundred Judas Maccabeus, how he had um, vanquished uh, the Greeks and brought liberation and, and freedom. It's a bit like uh, we might celebrate, uh, remember, a victory in Europe day or D Day or some great. A military victory that ensures our freedom and our liberty in our nation. So, this is the fe festival of dedication. It was one of their newer holidays compared to the and other holidays that were over a thousand years old. This was a newer one. And it, Jesus again went down to Jerusalem, and it was and it was winter. It was winter time, so it's a bit cold. People are maybe wearing jackets or whatever exactly they might have worn down there. There's a chance there could have been some snow on the ground. It did seem to happen a little bit more a couple thousand years ago than it does today. Uh, but even today, in the even through the 20th century. Snow in the mountains around Jerusalem were not completely unheard of. So you can imagine sort of a winter scene. Uh, Jesus walking through the city. And he's going through the complex in Solomon's colonnade, a part of the temple. And maybe he's there reflecting, maybe he's there praying, maybe he just wanted uh, some time to be alone with God, to think about the great deliverance that God had called Jesus to bring and how it was both similar and different to the one that the Maccabees uh, brought for Israel. And you see him just sort of walking through, and he's thinking, and all of a sudden, boom, he's surrounded. All his critics, all his enemies, all the people who really wanted to stick it to him and had political differences with Jesus and theological differences with Jesus, it, it, you get this idea of where, whoa, you just went to be alone, you just went to think, and all of a sudden, you're surrounded by people who don't like you, by people who, who wish you were dead. 
uh, people who just don't want you. They're jealous of you. They're envious of you. They think you're a problem. Every good thing you do, they, they turn around and misconstrue that for something bad. You have people like that in your life, I'm sure. I certainly do. And Jesus had a ton of them. Jesus is surrounded by his harshest critics. And they say, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, if you've been paying attention so far to this book, you know this is sort of a, it's a bit disingenuous. It's not really a sincere question. Uh, They've had these conversations. Jesus has made it clear who he is. So why are they asking him the question if it's not from a sincere place? Why? Well, the same reason uh, maybe many in the media, social media even, they kind of look for these little clips, these little sound bites that they can misconstrue and use against their enemies. People on the left do it to people on the right. People on the right do it to people on the left. And centrists do it to everybody. You know, you, you, you find these little clips, these little sound bites, these short little answers to complicated questions, and you use it to, to, try, to try to disempower your enemy, to, get, to kind of undercut some of their moral authority. They knew exactly who Jesus believed himself to be. They knew exactly who Jesus was uh, teaching. He, they had asked these sorts of questions before, but they, they're getting a whole circle around, a whole bunch of witnesses. So tell us, are you the Messiah? You know, it was the right season to be asking a question like that. This is when people were thinking about the Messiah because of the holiday that was going on. And how does Jesus respond? Does he just say, yeah, uh, I guess I am? (laughs) Well, no, he, he knows their hearts. He knows why they're asking what they're asking. And he says, I did tell you, and you don't believe me. He said, listen, I, I've made it pretty clear. Uh, I've made it clear who I am on a number of occasions. You've heard me, and it's only made you more angry. And now you're just looking for another soundbite that you can use as rumors to spread about me throughout the city. He said, listen, I have told you, and you don't believe me. It's interesting how Jesus isn't just being defensive or speaking about himself, but he's turning it back on his critics and saying, the problem isn't my lack of clarity. The problem is your lack of belief. And a lot of times that's true with, you know, people uh, reading the Bibles. They often say, oh, you know, I've heard about Christianity. I've heard the gospel. Uh, I tried to read the Bible, but, you know, it's just all too complicated. It's all just too confusing. Now, first of all, not to overstate my point, are there some bits in the Bible that are maybe hard to understand? Well, yeah. But as its core, is the gospel message very complicated or hard to understand? No, not really. Uh, Is large parts of the Bible fair to a literate person? Yeah, probably the good majority. However, there's something in us, there's something in us, this, this bit of unbelief that we hear these things and we think, no, that can't be true. The things that Jesus claim and some of the promises he makes and some of the great Genesis to Revelation, they're so almost overwhelming for our mind that it's not so much we don't understand. We just have trouble believing very often. And this is what Jesus is saying. Hey, it's not that I haven't been clear on this point. You guys, you just don't believe. You've heard the message. You've heard me claim who I am. I've talked about where I come from, who I am, and what I'm going to be doing, and you have not believed in your hearts. That is the issue. It's not my lack of clarity. It's your lack of belief. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you don't believe because you are not my sheep. So he says, guys, the the reason there's no faith in your heart, it's you're not my sheep. You're not mine. You have no relationship with me. And if you don't have a relationship with me, how are you supposed to believe my words? Well, how do we know if we're we're Christ's sheep or no? How do we know if we're part of his flock? Well, he goes on to describe it. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. So he kind of uses this they and I, they and I uh, language. They hear my voice, I know them. They follow me, I give them eternal life. They, they hear me and they respond, they follow me, and I know them. Now, no, that's knowing not just in the intellectual sense, but knowing in, in the familiar sense. So, 
as opposed to I know about them, but I actually know them, uh, and they know me. We, we have a relationship, and they hear my voice. For some of you, you, you don't hear Christ's voice. He doesn't know you, and you don't know him. There, there, there's no intimate relationship, and you're not following him. You might know about Christianity. You might think church is a good thing, and, and maybe you even come here regularly. You might believe God exists, and the universe isn't a big accident. A living relationship with Christ, the idea of, of hearing his voice, of him speaking to you, of, of you being changed on the inside out, that you don't know what that's like. You're not part of Christ's flock. Oh, like the Pharisees, you may believe in God's existence, or you may be religious in different ways, but you don't know Christ. And Christ is saying, listen, here's, here's what my flock does. They hear my voice, and not just hear, but the, it's, it's a type of hearing that implies a response. Where when we hear the gospel, that yes, I'm a sinner, and yes, I need a Savior, that something about that rings true, and we respond in faith, and we confess our sins, and we ask for his help, and we follow him in obedience. We just don't hear sermons on a Sunday, or we just don't read the Bible throughout the week and think, oh, what an interesting thought. Hmm, I'm going to have to ponder that. No, we hear God's word, and we think, right, my life has to be different now. I have to actually obey, not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. I know them, and they follow me. Follow Christ. I, think about this. This is an honest question. Some of you are like, yeah, I follow Christ. Do you? What was the last thing he asked you to do? When was the last time you had to obey and it required courage? When did you have to kind of step out of the boat? When has he last challenged you to to, to take a leap of faith, to do something you were uncomfortable doing, but you know it was obedience to Christ. And you fear of man or fear of circumstances, well, you had to follow him. When was the last time you did that? And it made a difference in how you lived. And it required you to live differently to people around you. My sheep, they hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. What a great relationship to be in. There's so much fear in the world right now that knowing Christ and knowing that he gives you eternal life and knowing that you will never perish. Wow. That either, that's the thing about Jesus. This is what you can when it comes to Jesus. You can't. The, the things that he says, the promises he makes, either it's complete lunacy or it's the greatest hope that this world has ever known. It's one or the other when it comes to Jesus. He's not just another philosopher, or guru, or teacher of some sorts where, you know, you can kind of pick and choose. Oh, I like this, but I'm not so sure about this. It's like he, he's so bold in what he says that you either reject him as a madman or, or you take him at his word. He says, they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Did you catch that, how he just very synonymously, from one sentence to another, talks about his hand and the Father's hand? Yes, they're in my hand, and yes, the names and languages that the Jews would ascribe only to God, and Jesus would use that for himself. And he would talk about God being the good shepherd and him being the good shepherd, and, and in his mind, all these things are one. This is part of Jesus' self-identity, that he is the one that comes out of the very heart of God, that he is divine because he comes from God. He is God's word actually spoken out of the mouth of God coming from out of eternity into time, from the eternal creator into creation. That's why Jesus says, yeah, the sheep of God, they're in my hand. Yes. And he uses this in, in a very synonymous way. But what a great, not only is it an amazing statement when you think about Jesus' self-awareness of who he understood himself to be, but listen, this is a promise for you. That, listen, I have good news for you. Some of you, you're anxious. You have a lot of anxiety right now. You have a lot of tension in your life. 
And different people have it for different reasons. For some people, you're scared of uh, this COVID and uh, the, the way the media portrays it as being this, you know, uh, deadly thing and it's going to kill you. And well, th there's probably some truth to that. Probably some truth to that. Some people think it's exaggerated. Some people think it might be accurate. Whatever. Wh whatever you believe it uh, to be, however deadly you believe it to be, uh, you have a lot of fear in you. There's people on the other side, though, who aren't particularly bothered by the bothered uh, by the government controlling their lives, the government telling them if they can see their friends or their relatives. And they're much more scared of government overreach than they are of the coronavirus. Some people are scared of the coronavirus and other people are scared. Well, you know, if you gave them a choice between drinking a pint of coronavirus and another month of lockdown, they would down the pint of coronavirus in, in no time flat. We fear different things. You might be afraid of losing your job. You might be afraid of poverty. Maybe this whole coronavirus and government-enforced lockdown has caused you to lose your business. Maybe the money's not coming in the way it did last year, and you're scared of poverty. We're scared of different things, depending on how we see the world and depending on our circumstances. But Christ's promise is a good, of good news for you, regardless of what your views are, regardless of your opinions are. This promise is for you. Nothing can take you out of Christ's hand. The coronavirus cannot take you out of Christ's hand, whether you catch it or not. The lockdown, the, the government-enforced lockdown, cannot take you out of the hand of Christ. Your life is in him. He has you. Uh, you are his, and he will give you eternal life. Maybe you're Maybe this, all the madness of this year has caused your circumstances to, to result in a loss of income, and you're just on the breadline. You don't know how you're going to eat next week. That's a tough place to be. Guess what? Your Christ is, your life is hid with Christ and God. You are his sheep. Your life is in his hand. And nothing can take away from you. If you are in Christ, nothing can take away from you what is truly important. If it's buried with Christ, if your life is buried with Christ, then one day it will be raised up again. And yes, this life might not be fair. Yes, you might catch illnesses and flus. Yes, you might die young. Yes, that could happen. Also, yes, it could be that the government oversteps and robs you of a year. Maybe you had great plans with friends and family and vacation, and the government and its overreach has stolen all of that. Yeah, maybe, maybe that is true. Maybe it is that your job opportunities, you're going to start a new business, or you're going to get a... And now there's a loss of income, and you can't afford to do a lot of the things you wanted. And not just wanted, but maybe even some things you really needed, some basic things. Maybe you missed a few bills or, or you know some days maybe without eating that, like that's that's one that's genuinely tough uh, I'm not trying to belittle any of that and there is a place for grief and there's even a place for anger in the face of all of these things absolutely but we don't experience grief and anger like people who experience grief and anger without hope you see if you believe this life is the only life you have and that's it that that you're going to live and then we're going to die and then there's just nothing well I, un I understand uh, maybe exaggerated measures to try to protect their lives, to, to keep themselves from a virus. That kind of makes sense. I understand people who um, want to basically start a revolution and throw off the government because of it's over, because they want to live free. They, they want a nice free life, and they don't want the government telling them if they can hug their sister or not. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I get those people who maybe are facing poverty because of all of this, and, uh, you know, and they want to not just be sad, but they want to despair because... The idea of having a prosperous life, a life full of blessings, now seems gone from them. I understand why people would completely lose it if they believe this life is all it has. But Jesus makes a promise. Whatever your circumstances and whatever, more, perhaps sometimes more important, whatever your interpretation and view of your circumstances are, is this. Jesus says he's going to give you eternal life. You will never perish, and no one will ever take you from his hand. Not a virus. Not a government, not, uh, an econom not your economic circumstances. You will have eternal life. This life is short. Those of you who are young, maybe you're watching this with your parents, and you think, oh, no, life is long. Trust me, you're going to blink, and you're going to be 25, and you're going to blink, and you're going to be 40, and you're going to blink, and you're going to be in your 60s. It goes by quick. And the older you get, the quicker it seems to go by. Th this life is a dressing room. If your life is not in the hands of Christ, then when things fall apart, when your business fails, when your uh, spouse, your partner, whoever leaves you, 
when a child dies or your parent, whatever, it, then it's not, yes, Christians experience sorrow and anger. But in the midst of that, we have hope. And Christ offers you hope even when you're going through the hardest of circumstances. Guys, this is a promise we need. And he makes it on the basis of who he is. Well, how do the Jews respond to this? Well, uh, let me just read those last few words here in verse 30. You know, where Jesus said, listen, they can't take them out of my hand because they're in the Father's hand. And he uses his hand and the Father's hand synonymously. And then he says, the Father and I are one. Well, what happens at that moment? How do they respond to a statement like that? Again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. Guys, how would you respond in this situation? You make a statement, you're surrounded, first of all, by your critics. Some of you, we'd be terrified. I mean, I'd be, most of us would be terrified, if not all of us. About the people who are the most harsh with you, the most critical of you. If you're standing in a circle and you're surrounded by the people who are the most critical of you in the whole world. First of all, that's just terrifying for some of you. But then as you're in sort of a discussion debate with them, you say something and they all pick up stones. And you know what they're thinking. That, like, that's a terrifying, I mean, I don't know, I'd be like, ah, ah, you know, I, I'd probably, I'd freak out. I probably would. I mean, I like to think I'd be all tough and cool, but no, chances are, you know, uh, absolutely. Uh, and yet Jesus, he's, he's totally cool. He's totally in control. He doesn't lose it. Jesus res- replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these works are you stoning me for? We aren't stoning you for good works, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. I think it's interesting. Sometimes I meet people who uh, they don't believe uh, in the very centerpieces of Christian faith. They're interested in Jesus, but they don't believe in the, the central things that Christians have believed for 2,000 years. They'll say, oh, I find Jesus interesting, but, you know, that, all that stuff about the Trinity or, you know, Jesus being divine in some way, like, like he's part of the creator God. Uh, uh, you know, n- n- none of that stuff is for me, the incarnation or whatever you call it. And they say, you know, I, I'm not sure. You know, I, I think maybe the early Christians or the Jews. He was just a great rabbi, or maybe, or maybe you know, he's some sort of guru or angel in human form or something like this. And yet, in Jesus' day, his critics and his friends both seem to understand very clearly what it was he was claiming. I, I don't think that the Jesus, who had memorized the same scriptures as Jesus, who lived in the same culture as Jesus, I don't think they were trying to stone him because I think they understood perfectly what he was saying. They understood what he was saying, and they understood that it was blasphemy. That is, blasphemy if it's not true. He said, you're blaspheming because you're making yourself out to be God. Now, this would be a great pants if the Jews had, of course, misunderstood him for Jesus to say, whoa, wait a minute, no way, guys. Whoa, you you grossly misunderstood me. I'm not making myself out to be God. Whoa, no, 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 let's back up a little bit. And Jesus doesn't do that. There's many times they're about to stone him for blasphemy. And never once does Jesus say, oh, no, sorry, eh, no, I'm sorry, there's something that was lost in communication here. Jesus never responds to their attempts to kill him in that way. But he does show them an inconsistency here. His response is, uh, I'll read the response, and then it's a little complicated, then I'll, I'll try to explain it. Jesus answered them, isn't it written in your scriptures? I said, you are gods. If he called those whom the word of God came to gods and the scriptures cannot be broken do you say you are blaspheming to the one the father set apart and sent into the world because i said i am the son of god if i am not doing my father's works don't believe me but if i am doing them and you don't believe me believe the works this way you will know and understand that the father is in me and i in the father and they were trying to seize him and they eluded his grasp Okay, you kind of read that through that the first time. That's like, whoa, what, what was that all about? Jesus. Okay, so, um, you know, there's this charge of blasphemy. Uh, Jesus is equating himself uh, with the Father in some ways, or at least you know, not saying that they're the same person, but at least saying that there's a oneness there in their nature and who they are. And he's saying, listen, okay, uh, you're getting all upset because I've claimed to be the son of God. 
He goes, but, but let's think about this. Even in the scriptures, and whenever Jesus talks about the scriptures, he's meaning what today we call the Old Testament, but Jesus didn't call it that. He just called it the scriptures. He said, you know, in the scriptures, there are occasions when this title is used, and that's true. And he quotes one of them. Psalm is from Psalm 82. And in it, it, King David is speaking to the judges of Israel who were not always acting justly. They were not always acting as they should be. And the verse is like, you judges are like gods. Or you are gods to the people that you are judging. You see, judges had the, the rule of life and death over people. If they were guilty of a capital of offense, a judge in ancient Israel could, could see someone put to death. And there are times where certain human beings occupy an office that is almost godlike. We have kings, and yet we call God a king, and we believe God is a judge, and yet sometimes we have human judges, and in, sometimes in places even have the word of life and death over people. And even the term father, we call God father, and yet we have earthly fathers that in some way reflect him. And so occasionally, not very often, but occasionally, even in the, the Old Testament scriptures, uh, this term uh, is used of you are gods or you are a son of God or kind of used in a, a bit of a poetic way to talk about their function, not their nature, but their function, what it is they're doing. These people are judging over people similarly to how God judges over people. And Jesus says, listen, OK, I've said that, but let's just go on your level for a second. You, you don't believe what I'm saying is true about me being the son of God. OK, and you're going to stone me for it. But then again, it, it isn't. Son of God occasionally used in the Old Testament under certain conditions for, for people and their functions. And that wasn't, you don't believe that's blasphemy. Of course it can't be blasphemy. It's the scriptures. You know, in a way, he's entering into their worldview and pointing out an inconsistency. Maybe you've done that. Maybe if you're a Christian, you've done that with uh, some friends, maybe who are atheists or unbelievers. You kind of, and you say, okay, let's presume there is no God. How then do we explain? And this is a bit what Jesus is doing. He's sort of entering his name. He's like, oh, okay, how is this consistent, guys? How are you even being consistent here? Uh, you know, even if I was just saying I'm the son of God in the same way that maybe these other people were, they weren't blaspheming. But then he draws the distinction. You know, he, he's not saying he's like those judges because he's drawing a distinction. If if that term could be used to the ones to whom the word of God came. In other words, these judges and these human beings, they're the ones who spoke to. How much more would it be appropriate for the one that comes from the Father? Those to whom the word of God comes, that is humanity, created order, and then there is the one who comes from the Father, who is the word of God. That's, that's him. He says, guys, if it, if it was appropriate for certain people in certain conditions, why is it so outrageous to the one who really is the son of God to be called the son of God? And so and Jesus is calling them out for inconsistencies, showing them their hypocrisy, and he's ultimately claiming uh, this for himself, this title, son of God for himself, in a unique way that even the people in the Old Testament who received this title did not get. And then he calls him, he goes, guys, again, just look at my works. Am I doing the things the Father does? Am I healing people? Am I saving people? Am I redeeming lives? Am I giving hope and forgiveness? And, and yes, those are all the things that Jesus is doing. And he goes, they tried to seize him. You know, they're, they're so frustrated. They're so angry. And yet he somehow escapes. I kind of wanted to know, I kind of want to know how he did this. Like he's surrounded by all these people, and they try to grasp him, and he, he escapes. And I don't know if this is some, he did some sort of, I don't know, James Bond stunt something or something from the Matrix where he appears and disappears, or maybe he's just a fast runner, you know, Usain Bolt sort of stuff. I don't know what it was. But a lot of times the Bible says Jesus' enemies were after him, he eluded their grasp. Uh, but it doesn't really say how he did it. Uh, one day we'll find out, hopefully. It then ends this way. It says, so he departed again to the Jordan, to the place where John had been baptizing earlier, and he remained there. And many came to him and said, John never did a sign, but everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. All right, so uh, it ends. Jesus leaves the city, goes out uh, by the River Jordan to where uh, John the Baptist had been baptizing people, and people came out to Jesus. Maybe it doesn't say where they're from. Presumably, many people of uh, them were from Jerusalem. 
Um, and Jesus, uh, they went out to Jesus. They, they kind of left the city to, to go there to listen to him. It says many be- believed in him in that place. One of the topics of conversation these, these people brought up while they were out there with Jesus was the fact that, you know what, and probably because they were there by the Jordan River where John used to baptize before he, had, he was killed, they, they were probably talking and just being in that place reminded them of John the Baptist, and they said, you know what, all the things that John the Baptist used to say about the one coming after me, this guy's doing it. This is the guy John was speaking of. Now, they knew exactly what John had said, but maybe we need a bit of a refresher course. John said three things about Jesus. First of all, I said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Secondly, it said, there's one coming after me, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And the third thing he said about Jesus was that he is the coming bridegroom. He is humanity's bridegroom that will be just like a husband and a wife come together in union. One day, heaven and earth will come together in union. One day, God and his people will come together in union. That is the great hope. Those are three things that for the Christian is past, present, and future. We look back on what Jesus did. He was the Lamb of God who died on the cross for our sins. We believe in what he's doing presently, that he is the one who fills us with his Holy Spirit, that that he is the gift from God. Listen, you need the Holy Spirit. Your life needs the the presence and the life of God that you can really live. There is a thirst and a hunger inside of every human heart, and we spend our lives trying to fill and satisfy that thirst, and Jesus comes to give it in in the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, he is humanity's bridegroom. Just like a husband, you know, in ancient Israel, in the weddings, the, the husband would come to the wife's house to receive the bride, and one day he will come for his people, and that is our great hope. Yes, maybe things are falling apart currently. You know what? In a year like 2020, it's a lot easier to look forward to a great hope uh, than maybe in some other years. Maybe things are falling apart in 2020. Maybe, and guess what? Maybe 2021 won't be any better. Maybe 2020 has just been a warm-up for 2021, and things are going to get even worse. I don't know. Uh, We'll have to see. But I know this. Whether 2021 is better or worse, uh, we have a bridegroom coming. We have a bridegroom coming. He's going to bring a new kingdom, and he's going to unite heaven to earth. And, you know, none of our leading politicians, not uh, Boris Johnson or, or not uh, Biden or Trump or, or Macron down in France or, or any of these others are going to fix this world's problems. So we pray for them, and we pray they won't screw things up too much worse than they already are. Uh, may God give them all wisdom, but they're not going to bring heaven to earth. There's only one who's going to do that. And his name is Jesus. And that's why even in the midst of everything falling apart, and yes, we do get sad, and yes, we do get angry, we are people of hope. And even in the midst of suffering, we can have joy. If you don't know Jesus, if all you know is religion, if all you know is ideology, then maybe something I've said today has offended you. And you know what? That's actually a healthy place. If you're offended by the preacher, if you're offended by the teaching of God's word, if it upsets you, that's not a bad sign because... It means you've probably understood. The people who get angry at some of the sermons we give, they're not the people I have a problem with. It, you, it's, in fact, if you never get angry at anything we say here at Therfield Chapel, you're probably not paying much attention. Uh, you're probably not listening very well. People are angry at Jesus. They want to throw stones at him because they understood the, the hugeness of his claims and therefore what it meant for their lives. Because if Jesus is who he said he was, that has huge implications for your life. Big time. And, and it's, at the end of the day, you're going to be one or the other. You're going to be one of those guys with a stone ready to throw it at Jesus, or you're going to be one of those leaving the city to be with him outside the city and believing on him. The, the middle's going to get cleared out. You're going to be on one side or the other. You're going to be trying to kill him because he offends your ideology and your view of the world. And Jay, no, Jesus is so big that either he's the center of your worldview or he has no place in your worldview. You're going to either, you're going to worship him or you're going to try to stone him. The middle's going to get cleared out. Which one is it going to be for you? Because at some point, Jesus offends every single worldview, every single ideology. Your personal agenda, your political agenda, at some place, Jesus is going to offend it. And when it does, what are you going to do with that offense? Is that going to drive you to submit and to call him Lord or to pick up a stone and chuck it at him? Where are you at? 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who Jesus is, and we're just humbled by the words that he said. Father, I, I pray for those of us who are upset and bothered by the words of Jesus and just feel uncomfortable right now. Father, I pray that, um, I pray that our hearts would be open to the faith that you want to give us that these promises are right, that these promises are true. Father, I I said you would be with our people. Lord, that whatever we're afraid of, whether if we're afraid of coronavirus or whether we're afraid of the government overreaching itself or afraid of poverty and want or maybe something else altogether, Lord, that we would be comforted by your promises today.
I'd just like to close our service uh, this morning by, by reading from Romans chapter 16 and verses 25 to 27. Now to whom who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. That is all our service is now finishing, but uh, don't forget we have our fellowship group straight afterwards. Uh, ben will be putting the link up, so hang around. Don't go away if you want to join. Uh, either way, um, hope to see you very soon. Thank you.